I would say it's a Estonian for, version of uh, uh, Silicon Valley, but much funnier. There was lots of questions like, is it okay still like in the year 2014 to to become prime minister at, at such a young age? I thought that, yeah, we, we did good. In four months, we changed an important tax law. That's, that's good. And uh, some of the startupers uh, told me that, you know, could you be any slower in doing this? So <laughs> what I'm afraid of the most is that, uh, that uh, we have uh, political leaders that uh, think that we can go back to uh, exactly the same uh, time that was uh, uh, here, let's say, half a year ago. And I remember my friend Alex, Alexander Stoop saying that you know, it's great to have two, two prime ministers in the world who can give interviews in, in Finnish language. This is not always <laughs> the case. Hey, Darby, how are you doing? Hi, Petri. Thank you for inviting me to your podcast. It's been a crazy year, hasn't it? it we just barely approaching summer and, and, and things are not like they used to be. What's your feel, you know, of the world at this point? Yeah, and it feels like it has been a year, but actually it has been just a couple of months. And, and there's so many things have changed during that time already. Uh, the world is basically... Uh, closed. Uh, the world has stopped to a large extent, and uh, there are like lots of freedoms that we have given up uh, that we would have been impossible to give up uh, only just a few months ago. So, so yeah, it's it's crazy times we are living right now. Do you think that those rights they were taken away from us? Do you think we're getting them back, hundred percent, or is there going to be some kind of shift? where we're gradually creeping into the more big brother state or, or you know, these type of scenarios? Well, uh, one parallel that comes to my mind is, is 9-11. And people um, uh, had to give away quite a lot of their privacy in order to uh, make sure that the government uh, is uh, able to fight terrorism. Uh, probably uh, something uh, similar will happen in the near future as well. Some countries have already experienced with all sorts of uh, contact tracing, uh, which essentially is is uh, also potential threat to your privacy. Uh, but I believe that if you do it the right way, uh, you can find a good compromise and, and you can probably uh organize most of those apps and and uh, and solutions uh, all over europe this way that uh, that you don't violate people's privacy too much uh the current initial reaction has been in my opinion uh violating privacy too much including like in many countries sending the lists of uh, of uh, those who have the uh, infection uh, sending them to police Uh, even in Estonia, which is uh, very digital by nature, using all sorts of information systems, um, the, the the lists are have just been sent uh, like over emails and and uh, like the spreadsheets, and this is not the way to do it. So so we need to uh, design a better system how to deal with this uh, in the future, and hopefully we don't need to. Um, use policemen to to look at every citizen, uh, whether they stay at home or not. Uh, perhaps we can uh, invent something uh, much more digital and, and much less uh, work consuming. So there is still a lot of work to be done. What are the things uh, you can consider that we've been in, in Estonia doing pretty well? And what are the things absolutely not to do in the future and we need to find a better solutions? I think that uh, what the Estonian people have done extremely well is uh, being very, very disciplined. Uh, now it is changing a bit uh, because uh, people uh, can calculate. They understand that if there is um, like 0.5% of those who are tested, uh, and in Estonia we test only people with uh, certain symptoms or mostly people with certain symptoms, Uh, there are a couple of um, exceptions, of, of course, when you are working in the front line and so forth. Um, and, but if it's only 0.5 uh, uh, percent probability, then uh, people start feel start to feel that you know perhaps these restrictions uh, they, they they are not needed so much anymore. 
and I can really feel and understand that because uh, we are not very good in, in coming out of uh, those uh, very strong restrictions. Um, what else Estonia has done well? I think uh, coping with uh, social distancing is a uh, very Estonian thing and, and probably a very Finnish thing as well. So, so we don't uh, feel ourselves uh, uh, very well if, if, uh, uh, if the personal zone is, is too small. And, and, uh, and that's why I think Estonians are coping relatively well with, um, uh, with current time. Uh, also, of course, uh, the fact that um, Estonia, just like Finland, uh, has a lot of territory uh, is probably also quite useful. We don't have any metros in Estonia. We don't have uh, um, the necessity to, to meet with people uh, in, in many of the cases that are there in, in big cities, like, uh, let's say, Manhattan, uh, uh, area or, or something like that. So, so we have some advantages living here where we live. Talking about digital society, Estonia has been promoting and well known for the last decade at least uh, or of, of its uh, digital services and, and public services particularly. Uh, what is something Estonia can teach the other countries that, you know, and, and what's the future looking like? You know, what is Estonia looking uh, for the next 10 years and de- developing further? Well, the number one thing, uh, of course, is uh, proper digital identity and digital uh, signature. Uh, it is um, much easier to work from home where all your official business, be it signing documents, be it signing uh, uh, whatever uh, of official applications you need to sign, be it logging into any registry or, or doing any of your official uh, work stuff, uh, if, if this is all digital, uh, then it's, it's relatively easy to work from um, from your home office. So digital ID and signature, of course, are are the most essential uh, things. But also, like taking, uh, for example, health services uh, digital in Estonia. If you suspect that you have uh, uh, this uh, current um, uh, virus, uh, then you just call your uh, family pr- practitioner, uh, and uh, she can uh, write an electronic. Uh, uh, recommendation letter or, or I don't even know how it's called in English. The idea is that uh, that uh, you are good to go or, or you are eligible to go to, uh, for testing and, and this all moves electronically through very safe channels then the uh, those people who are testing they are uh, uh, given legal uh, right to have a look at this electronic system as well so, so no information is actually uh, sent anyway to, to anyone. It's just in the in the information system, and and then uh, you, if you are diagnosed uh, after let's say uh, twelve hours or so, it, it will be uh, in the patient's portal where you can safely log in yourself and you can see the result. So so all the path is fully digitized. There is no need to to um, use any any other uh, I'll say. Uh, measures that this channel is very, very secure. There is uh, nothing is kept on paper. So so in a way, it's, it's a very, very important design. And I think it's very important to, to stick to the, this as well. And then currently, as I said in the beginning, uh, the, the way the information is sent to some other authorities outside health space uh, uh, is not working the way the Estonian e-government should be working. So, so we, should, we should improve that uh, as, as soon as possible. How did we come here? I mean, it's just three decades and there was basically no services whatsoever available after the Soviet Union went down. And, and we were basically in a ground zero situation. And, and looking at Estonia and, and comparing it to the other Baltics and the other Eastern European countries, I think Estonia is quite exceptional in its services and, and, and the economic performance and, and pretty much in all, all the standards. Can you give some background and maybe explanations for why that's the case? Well, when Estonia uh, regained its independence in the early 90s, um, it was the, also the same time when uh, internet uh, was becoming a really big thing. And as all the Soviet uh, systems or all the 
Soviet uh, state uh, information bases or whatever, they, they were fully, I would say, rubbish by, by design or, or everything was analog, everything was, was basically, well, we needed to start everything from the scratch. And when you start something from scratch, uh, then it's very logical to use the uh, current uh, state-of-the-art uh, design. And, and then internet was, or, or using digital channels was the kind of state-of-the-art thing. It isn't, uh, uh, it doesn't look like uh, rocket science anymore, but back then it was still like very much uh, of the innovation. And we needed to teach people to use computers more. And, and it, was, it was definitely different times. Um, uh, the second thing, why Estonia is a bit different than many other countries that were occupied by Soviet Union is our neighborhood. I think that uh, having Finland and also Sweden as very close neighbors gives us the uh, immediate picture. And uh, this was especially relevant in the early 90s when the uh, difference in living standard was huge. Uh, and, and we immediately saw that our neighbors who are very similar to us are doing so much better in so many uh, sectors of life. It's not only economic uh, progress, it's many, many other things as well. And I think that, that gave us this kind of uh, urge to catch up, uh, catch up with the Finns. Of course, it, it has always been and still is a very, very difficult challenge as Finland and, and also Sweden are uh, among the most successful countries in the world, not only Europe, but the world. And uh, this drive to to kind of catch up and, and the belief that we are actually quite similar. And before the Soviet occupation, we were at similar uh, level of economic development and so forth. Uh, that gave us this kind of understanding that uh, we need to move very fast and do smart things. You were the youngest member of Estonian government uh, when you became the Minister of Social Affairs and also you were the youngest government leader in European Union at the time you became the prime minister. Um, do you think that it has something to do with, you know, young people being in these powerful positions uh, during this time of uh, the independence and after the, the, the Soviet Union going down, that, you know, the decisions were made a bit quicker and, and the new technologies and innovations were looked uh, sort of as a opportunities and, and positive future developments? Well, I think uh, it's, it's important to uh, have a closer look at the early 90s or actually already eight, late 80s when the independence movement started. Uh, it, to continue as a politician from communist regime to independence was uh, very, very difficult. Some people did it, some people did it uh, successfully because they chose the uh, side uh, immediately and they were not, uh, I would say, fully in uh, the, the communist or they were like, uh, they were part of, of politics back then, but they weren't like uh, diehard communists. Uh, uh, and, uh, and most of the politicians who, who started then were, they, they needed to be new people, so to say, or, or, or like, new to politics. And of course, uh, this already meant that many of them were straight out, out of school. Uh, so so those people starting um, uh, our uh, newly independent uh, country from scratch, uh, they were, were very young people and, and much younger than I was when I first started my work as, as government minister. Even I, I haven't been the youngest prime minister of Estonia. That was Mark Blar uh, with his first government in the early 90s. Uh, but I was the youngest in in uh, European Union. That's that's correct, and and I think it has some parallels to to the time that we had in the early 90s. Just because uh, people knew that it is okay to be in leadership uh, at a relatively young age, uh, it also means that in Estonia uh, we start our working career. Uh, uh, typically quite early, so it's very logical to work uh, already. Uh, you know, having summer jobs when you are, uh, uh, let's say, a high school student, or or work when you are de uh, studying in the university. So, so that gives a like little bit of a head start when you when you graduate from university, which in my case was two thousand and two. You already have uh, 
uh, some uh, work experience. Um, uh, but my, my age as, as prime minister, I would say that in Estonia, it was first still like a bit uh, of, a, I would say, negative connotation. I think it lasted around like a week or so. There was lots of questions like, is it okay still like in the year 2014 to to become prime minister at, at such a young age, but uh, but then it uh, stopped being an issue at all in Estonia, and uh, internationally it was from day one to the last day of my work as prime minister, or actually probably already, uh, it still is a, a positive connotation uh, showing that you know young people can can do lots of things, and and I think it's it's pretty similar to to the attention uh, uh, that uh, Finnish prime minister, who is, if I'm not mistaken, the youngest uh, prime minister of European Union currently uh, is getting. And she was exactly the same age uh, when she started as prime minister, like I was uh, six years before. Can you share some memories and maybe some achievements what you were proud of while you were uh, prime minister? and? and- I think you were even in some talk shows in the US. <laughs> you, you were getting a bit of uh, you know fame in the, around the world. Well, the, most of the uh, reasons why I was invited to uh, all uh, international news outlets uh, were two issues. Uh, first was uh, uh, about the, uh, the conflict in um, in uh, or the Russia attacking Ukraine. Uh, and Estonia as an immediate neighbor of um, of Russia and uh, a member of NATO at the same time, uh, and, and uh, you know we were considered to to be somewhat uh, experts on this topic, and, and discussing security issues was was big part of of, uh, of this. But second thing was that we created ourselves, and that was the uh, all the attention about uh, e residency. E residency started. Uh, uh, in the early early months of my uh, work as prime minister, and, and we really pushed hard to get it uh, international uh, recognition and international uh, let's say attention. And, and uh, throughout the years, uh, that was also one topic that that got me invited to perhaps more uh, talk shows that would be would be normal or would be would be typical. Uh, but I think there. There are lots of things that uh, that we did, uh, uh, important things that we did during that time. Of course, one was uh, boosting Estonian security, like everything from increasing uh, our own military expenditure to to get NATO presence here, uh, guarding our skies, for example, or or having a NATO uh, unit uh, uh, here for good or for like a per- a permanent uh, presence of of uh, NATO allies in, in Estonian territory. But it was also uh, investing uh, heavily in in other uh, things that are related to your uh, security. For example, uh, NSA security, uh, building uh, interconnections uh, with um, with Finland and Latvia, be it gas or electricity, uh, being uh, less dependent on any any uh, outside uh, factor on on uh, on energy or or of course many other things as well. So it was very very interesting times uh, because uh, because uh, it, it gave us the chance. The, the terrible things that happened in, in in Ukraine gave us a chance to actually take our own security to the next level, and and that's what we did. Estonia has been building resilience during this crisis. I think there was also some kind of a cyber attack happening was it in your period as a prime minister which uh, was sort of an early warning on on the things which needs to be prepped up well so the cyber attack was actually uh, way before my time as as prime minister but that was during the time when i was uh, just newly elected member of parliament uh, and i remember this of course uh, uh, very closely uh, that happened in in uh, the spring of 2007 and it was linked to uh, a removal of uh, one old Soviet st- statue from the center of uh, of Tallinn. Uh, the story was basically that the Russian uh, it, it, the statue had been there for decades, and and it didn't really dis- disturb anyone. It was in very prominent place, like uh, like really really central location. Uh, 
but uh, what what happened was uh, uh, the Russian embassy started organizing um, uh, this kind of pro-Soviet nostalgic uh, meetings there, including taking uh, school children there, uh, lots of organized uh, things that was were very uh, uh, very, I would say, much hurting a uh, big part of, of our society. And, and thus, there was a decision taken that uh, this statue uh, needs to be moved to stop those provocations. This statue needs to be moved to to another place uh, where it is still uh, a very prominently uh, say, presented to this day, but it's not in the very center of the city. And then it's it's more difficult to, to organize all sorts of provocations there. And, and um, it just happened that uh, when this uh, statue was removed, at the same time, uh, there were huge uh, riots organized in, in Tallinn. And, and also at the exact same time, there was serious DDoS attack uh, against many Estonian uh, information systems. Uh, both public and private, it was uh, also banks and, and news um, news outlets and so forth. And, and uh, as, a, as a very first full-scale attack against uh, a, a state, that actually gave us um, this kind of, let's say, case story or, or how, to, how to react to this kind of things. And that gave, uh, uh, that was a very, very important lesson for us, uh, and not only us, but, but also for for NATO and, and European Union. So, so we managed to build a, a kind of experience uh, to expertise. And, and that was, I think, something that, of course, uh, sent or followed uh, us uh, throughout my time as prime minister as well, because Estonia um, spoke out a lot on, on taking cyber to uh, taking cyber seriously taking cybersecurity as part of, um, of uh, collective defense. And, and one important achievement was that uh, since summer 2016, when there was a NATO summit in Warsaw, since then, cyber is officially NATO domain, just like land, uh, water or, or air. Uh, now it's also cyber. So this means that uh, whenever there is attack uh, in cyberspace against any NATO member state, uh, it's also again uh, attack against all all of the NATO. So I think it's an important milestone. 2007 was hitting Estonia hard as well. I mean the financial crisis, and um, one of the things I, I recall from that time is that uh, there was a quite a heavy expenditure cut in the public sector. Was it then? So 20% uh, mm -hmm. was basically cut and, and there was like really drastic measures, you know, and they were like out heard of in the sense of, you know, considered what the other places were doing. Is this sort of a part of the, I'm using the resilient word quite a lot, but, uh, you know, this preparedness and being independent, uh, looking also the, the debt ratio, government red debt ratio, I think this, if it's not the, uh, lowest in the world is pretty much among the lowest in the world and and i must say that i'm, I'm quite impressed uh, not quite i'm really impressed you know how, how, how these things are actually handled here can you give a bit of uh, insight and and what's the future of these things well uh, the context of course uh, was that uh, 2006 2007 estonia experienced very 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 high growth rates we were talking about double digit growth rate and uh, our then government was uh, wise enough to to put uh, a lot of uh, the money that uh, we collected as taxes to putting it aside as reserves. So so that uh, the, the budgets in 2006, uh, seven, and, and uh, initially also 2008 were in, in serious surplus because of the very good times that uh, that the budget were were done, and, and then. You know, the first cut was relatively easy. You just cut the surplus yeah, and you already have taken a big leap. Uh, cutting actual expenses is uh, very, very difficult politically. And, and most political politicians are are not just able to cope with this. Uh, we, we actually lost uh, one of the coalition partners uh, while we were cutting uh, uh, costs. Uh, that was in, 
in uh, spring 2009. And interestingly enough, um, that uh, uh, sent me to the epicenter of the, of the economic crisis because as, uh, as uh, my uh, predecessor in the job of becoming uh, uh, chairman of the F uh, fiscal committee in the, in the parliament uh, was uh, uh, appointed minister of finance, Jurgen Ligi, my later good colleague, and he was minister of finance and, and uh, the minister of education and minister of uh, foreign affairs already also in, in my different governments. Um, I became uh, during the, the peak of the crisis for Estonia, it was in, in spring 2009, and during the peak of the cutting or, or ex expense cutting and austerity, I started my job as, as uh, chairman of the uh, finance committee. So that was interesting times indeed. Now, uh, later, I think we have just been very practical and, and following all the rules. Uh, we wanted to be eligible for uh, euro. So thus, we didn't even uh, consider having a much higher deficit than uh, would be allowed to, uh, according to the Stability and Growth um, Pact uh, in, in European Union. And, and also later, both uh, Andrew Sainzip's governments and, and my governments uh, kept this kind of um, good, good fiscal prudence. Uh, we kept uh, the, the uh, budget in balance uh, or in very small uh, surplus in some cases because we didn't experience uh, a very high growth but the growth was enough to to uh, uh, you know make meat uh, make uh, ends meet and and uh, currently of course uh, when we are experiencing another uh, serious uh, crisis uh, the outcome will probably be uh, worse in terms of uh, public budget because uh, because we didn't have the uh, we didn't have the surplus to to use and and uh, I, I would say that the government was was a bit less prepared uh, than than the government uh, that was in office in two thousand seven and eight. Being involved with the startup world, uh, I remember you, probably it was you. Who was saying at the time that you know if the startup community ecosystem needs something just uh, come to the government and we'll just fix it and and you know this matter of weeks or months uh you actually did us something you changed some law about options mm -hmm. uh is this something you know which can happen still now in the crisis and do you already see that happening and and you know is the willingness and the capabilities you know still there the attitude of like a startup attitude if there's a problem let's fix it and, and you know move on i think it has been at some points uh, with some ministers I, I i'm not objective to to tell whether the current prime minister has it or not because I, i'm i'm comparing with myself and every if you compare any anybody with yourself then you're not the most adequate person to do that but but uh i can Tell what we did, and, and as, as all prime ministers uh, in Estonia have usually some, um, um, let's say, um, councils that give them uh, special advice that are basically coming from not from law but basically from tradition. One of those is, for example, uh, uh, the advisory board uh, of, of science, and and and, and lot, there are several others. Uh, what I decided to create was. Um, uh, the similar advisory board uh, on startup ecosystem and, and also later uh, advisory board on, on uh, economic development. And I think that both of them, uh, uh, I got the luxury uh, because they were not uh, legally designed in any way or, or not, um, there was no rigid system already in place or traditions already in place that you need to invite this or that uh, official. Uh, I was free to choose whomever I, I wanted to invite there. And, and uh, as our start startup system is, um, our startup ecosystem is, is very, you uh, know, combined. There are lots of lots of very ambitious, very vocal, very experienced people. Uh, I managed to pick uh, some of the right uh, people uh, to this advisory board, and they actually helped me to push through uh, several things. And, and the, the the option, the law on options that we changed to be. Uh, coping better uh, with international uh, standards and, and uh, you know, the idea was to make Estonia as, as competitive with other countries as, as possible. Uh, it took us uh, four months exactly from the idea uh, that came, first came up in the 
in the startup roundtable or, or, uh, or advisory board, uh, and then it was passed as, as a law in, in uh, Parliament, so four months. And I was quite proud of that. I thought that, yeah, we, we did good. In four months, we changed an important tax law. That's, that's good. And uh, some of the startupers uh, told me that, you know, could you be any slower in doing this? So, <laughs> so basically, they were <laughs> extremely critical that it is, uh, it's taking the government uh, for four months to, to pass the law. So it, it probably, you know, depends a bit on, on the perspective. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I have this startup perspective uh, just next to me. Uh, reminding me that I should push uh, harder, I should do things faster, I should not uh, be happy with uh, the kind of normal de deadlines. Uh, there are sectors uh, in, in business and in life that, that need your focus much faster than, uh, than typical. You were also a movie star lately. <laughs> so were you? <laughs> <laughs> you had a bigger role. You 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 got a T-shirt. I didn't got a T-shirt. <laughs> that's uh, that's correct. Yes. Uh, that's <laughs> can you can you explain to the audience what was your role? Yes. Well, that was uh, that was a very uh, uh, very nice experience, actually. I would say. And the movie we are talking about is uh, Chasing Unicorns, and it's talking about um, a startup's pursuit for um, for. Um, I don't know happiness, but but also being uh, being successful in the startup life. Uh, it, I think the movie has a great uh, a great insight uh, inside perspective from the startup world, and many of the uh, aspects of the movie, many of the details are so good and so funny, just because they are actually coming from uh, real life. Of course, as as every movie, there are lots of um, lots of fun elements but you know sometimes uh, life is fun and, and some of the aspects of the startup world uh, uh, if you look at them from certain perspective you know if you are if you're inside you know if you're racing around and it's it's very difficult it can be very very stressful of course but but if you look at uh, it from perspective it is it is actually quite uh, quite fun and, and a lot of a uh, lot of interesting things happening so i would say it's a estonian version of of uh, of this uh, silicon valley but but much funnier talking about silicon valley estonia might have the highest density of uh, unicorns at least per capita skype was probably the first one and now I think I've lost already pretty much the count how many they are. This is really vibrant ecosystem happening here. What's your impression? Are we going to keep having a small Silicon Valley here in latitude 59? Or what's going to happen in the future? Well, uh, first of all, uh, Skype made all the difference because before that, uh, having a multi-billion dollar company was something that you just saw from uh, news. Uh, but the Skype uh, showed that the multi-billion dollar company can be done right here in Estonia by, by a very small uh, team of uh, very smart people. And, and uh, as, as many people were during the years uh, working for Skype or, or new people who worked for Skype, uh, Actually, that gave them this um, uh, certainty and and uh, also know-how uh, to to start their own company. So, if you look at the uh, current um, VCs, if you look at the current uh, uh, startup founders, startup investors, many of them have some sort of uh, previous relationship with uh, with Skype. Of course, now there is already like uh, I don't know. How, how many waves we have had, but um, now there are already like X TransferWise and X Bolt probably, and then X, X other companies. But 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 Skype was the initial huge wave that uh, that uh, took our startup uh, community to to next level, and and of course it has uh, for quite some time already been a, a top priority uh, from the government side as well because it's. Uh, Clearly showing that uh, that Estonia has a potential in this. Again, if you think practically, like Estonia has 
uh, had uh, only three decades to accumulate capital. Now, it's relatively difficult to accumulate capital in traditional sectors uh, so fast and, and become a, a global uh, company. There are some exceptions, but this is not very, very typical. But when we talk about digital, uh, this is the easiest sector probably to scale your business. And, and lots of our uh, uh, unicorns, be it uh, TransferWise or, or Bolt or, or Skype, they are essentially digital solutions to real world problems and and, uh, and that's why they are relatively I, I, nothing is easy in the world of course but especially doing business at this scale but but they're relatively easier to scale to to become global companies and and of course uh, i hope that uh, that the startup community today already is so strong that uh, they create uh, uh, new success stories um, government uh, should keep the eye on, on like not uh, messing things up, not messing uh, tax system up too much, not uh, messing, especially with foreign workers. Uh, we have currently one party in, in government that is uh, somewhat allergic to to people who are not uh, 101 percent ethnically Estonian, and I think it's ridiculous, of course, and it's it's very dangerous to to Estonian. Uh, uh, economy and, and, and society uh, in a wider perspective, but but if, if the government uh, can you know, control itself and not mess things up too much, I think today our startup sector is actually strong enough to to be able to create new success uh, by themselves as well. But of course, ideally, uh, we would see again uh, sometime soon a government that is. Uh, actively promoting Estonia as a startup uh, ecosystem, uh, looking at ways uh, constantly to improve the uh, environmental situation, uh, the economic context uh, mainly, of course, but, but all sorts of things that, that enable uh, startups to, to uh, succeed. So yeah, we can do much more, but, but I think that the foundation and, and, and good ecosystem are already there and and, uh, and it's it's very very important remote work is now the new norm and uh, post corona discussions are starting what, what do you think where we're heading and what's the new normal well i think it's a bit uh, early to say i think uh, one uh, clear trend that i hope to happen is that digitalization will uh, uh, speed uh, speed up uh, because uh, those politicians who have uh, been very cautious about digitalization they have less and less arguments uh, against it uh, also i believe that some sectors uh, well, we know that some sectors have already boosted like all sorts of video conferencing tools and 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 uh, all that but i think also sectors like uh, autonomous driving uh, uh, sectors like e-commerce uh, uh, they will get to totally next level and there is a lot of um, uh, changes happening and that of course gives a lot of uh, potential for uh, for uh, new kinds of companies new kinds of business models so i think it's it's actually a good time for uh, for the startup world um, yeah I, I th we are living extremely interesting times and that what i what i'm afraid of the most is that um, that uh, we have uh, political leaders that uh, think that we can go back to uh, exactly the same uh, time that was uh, uh, here, let's say, half a year ago. But, but you, you can never do that. You can never go back exactly to the point where you were six, six months ago, yet alone now when, when the changes that have uh, happened have been so huge. Uh, and, and I think there are lots of... Um, uh, things that are restricting our freedoms potentially, but there are also lots of things that are uh, uh, making the world a better place, uh, including, for example, uh, uh, being able to live uh, in a countryside uh, and, and uh, work from there, or, or um, less need to, to fly uh, to, let's say, Brussels uh, for just uh, uh, one or two hour meeting, you can just do a lot more effectively those things and 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 save uh, environment at the same time. So, so I mean, 
th there are lots of things that uh, that uh, are changing, and, and uh, I'm sure I don't know all of them, but but I, I have a feeling that, that some of the interesting trends uh, uh, are actually very very positive to the world. I'm writing an article about uh, this post corona world and, and one of the things I'm gonna put in the next one next part in the series is the uh, the globe is flat not in a physical sense obviously but you know in the sense that everybody in the world eight billion people are a few hundred milliseconds away so basically we have now sort of equalized and democrat democratized the world because there's no need to travel anymore it's acceptable to be uh, in the Minamit or Zoom or Skype. But what does that actually mean to the tax base, trade, competencies, com competitiveness, regulation, public services? I think these are sort of really interesting and probably difficult questions and challenges we are facing. And e-residency and, and Estonia has been leading this movement and wave already some years what, what do you mm -hmm. think, you know, what's going to happen in, in this sense? Is the role of the governments, the, you know, going down and the sort of individuals and, and private services becoming more important? Well, I think we have uh, seen this trend uh, for quite some time already that uh, for uh, more and more uh, jobs, uh, your physical location is uh, not so relevant. Uh, and you can work uh, remotely, you can work uh, uh, from either home or, or summer house or, or a distant uh, distant uh, location. And, and now we probably see more uh, uh, jobs that are going this way. Uh, and we have we have experienced a lot of uh, uh, zoom zoom conferencing or, or teams conferencing. and, and uh, once people um, uh, as, you, as you correctly said, uh, think that this is now acceptable, uh, they want to be effective, uh, and, and they don't just fly uh, fly in for for a very like a short intervention or, or something like that. So so it it will it will change a uh, definite lot of things. But I think there will still be urge and perhaps even bigger urge uh, in people to to travel uh, for fun. Uh, I think keeping people in their in their small apartments uh, for two months uh, uh, will probably mean that once they once the quarantine is over, they can uh, like they really want to go to Sarema or they really want to go to to restaurants and, and all sorts of places. And, and of course, they also want to to travel because uh, uh, because this is what what people want to do. Now, the role of governments, I, I have thought that for quite some time already, uh, way before. Uh, uh, Corona crisis, uh, and, and even before when I became prime minister, I think that this is uh, moving in this uh, uh, direction that governments need to um, be in, in constant competition for uh, for people. Uh, you, you, like you, this has been for quite some time already that governments have been competing to get uh, uh, investments. Uh, but, but the same applies now more and more to, to people uh, who pay the taxes. Uh, if you uh, can offer good services for uh, uh, effective uh, tax rate, like uh, not too high, but uh, like acceptable, uh, then you can uh, be very, very successful. And, and I don't think that, uh, that it's only the big countries that win from this. I think it's probably... Uh, even vice versa, you know, if small countries uh, are smart, they, they can react much, much faster and, uh, and have more people uh, uh, using their services. Uh, and Estonia e-residency idea has been just that. But I, I think, of course, we should create uh, much more services uh, for our e-residents. I think uh, there is room for both pub public and private sector to to provide more services for those people who are not actually living in Estonia, but who are using uh, Estonian government uh, services. You speak fluent Finnish, and that's not um, 
evident, you know, Estonian and Finnish languages are not so close to each other that, you know, one day you can just wake up from the bed and <laughs> just realize that you speak Finnish. So, so what happened? <laughs> uh, well, this is something that uh, people uh, my age uh, who lived uh, in their childhood uh, in the in Tallinn or in the north, northern coast uh, can do. This is our superpower. And, and this is coming from uh, from Finnish TV because uh, during our childhood when it was still uh, Soviet Union there were no private uh, TV channels uh, in Estonia obviously there was almost no private things uh, at all or private sector uh, businesses so uh, what happened was uh, Finnish uh, TV I have heard later of course it wasn't the public no- knowledge back then but the Finns uh, turned up the volume, so to say. Uh, they they made their uh, the Finnish uh, broadcasting system much uh, more powerful than it was uh, uh, needed to broadcast just for Finland, but it, it was well visible across the bay, which is around 80 kilometers if you if we're talking about uh, uh, the distance of, of Tallinn and Helsinki. Uh, and that made it possible with uh, special antennas, of course, but still it, it was possible to uh, watch Finnish TV and I can see it now from my own kids that um, they are not watching Finnish TV, unfortunately, anymore, but they are watching uh, YouTube. And even my three-year-old uh, son uh, is speaking re- quite well in English uh, just because of, of TV and just because uh, sometimes uh, uh, me and my wife are speaking uh, or speaking in English with him. And that exactly happened to me as well. So, so I, I watched a lot of uh, um, Finnish uh, pra- uh, channel called the Maikkari or the MTV Kolbe, and, and uh, that had a lot of uh, uh, original pr- programs uh, like talk shows or, or entertainment, and it also had uh, lots of films that were not available uh, in in Estonia before that. Uh, uh, and uh, all the films or, or, or TV series, they were um, subtitled. So, so that was very important. You, you can listen to it in English and you can read Finnish at the same time. So, so in a way, that made all the difference. And because of that uh, heavy TV watching in my childhood, uh, it was possible for me to, to communicate. Uh, now I have had, uh, I have had the three... Uh, Finnish uh, co- colleagues as prime ministers, and, and I know, uh, I know even more uh, former prime ministers. So with them, I I happily can talk in 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 Finnish, and I have given a couple of interviews as well uh, uh, in Finnish language. I, and I remember my friend Alex Alexander Stoop saying that you know, it's great to have two two prime ministers in the world who can give interviews in in Finnish language. This is not always <laughs> the case. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I, I think it, it was a unique time uh, when I was I was exactly the right age to to learn uh, Finnish language. What is your favorite word? Oh, um, well, uh, as we are now uh, speaking about uh, Finnish language, I would say uh, one word in in uh, Finnish that uh, that uh, comes to my mind, and, and this is asia naya. And uh, why it's a good word is because it's fun uh, seeing uh, people who speak uh, English to, to try to pronounce it. Uh, this is, is, uh, it, it means lawyer. Uh, and to, to see anyone who doesn't know Finnish uh, trying to pronounce it is, is just hilarious. Your least favorite word? <laughs> I, I, one one it's it's not a word it's an expression that i i don't like at all uh, and this is it has always been this way and, and this has been uh, used too much as an argument uh, why not to improve things uh, and this is probably this is mostly uh, in politics and civil service but but sometimes you see that in in uh, in private sector as well, and I, I'm not arguing that 
traditions are are bad um, uh, on the contrary but i'm arguing that uh, that uh, you shouldn't like uh, stop asking questions you shouldn't uh, stop questioning why things are the way they are what turns you on creatively spiritually or emotionally well uh, i think now it would be definitely uh, sun coming out and and, and good uh, good weather and uh, and i i have uh, always well not always but for for the last eight years or so found a lot of strength from uh, uh, from exercising i i used to especially running i used to be the worst uh, runner uh, or, or like second to worst or third third worst uh, runner in my class always when i went to school but then uh, i think it was eight or nine years ago i just decided and that actually happened in in Finland, we were at the, at the conference, and then we uh, we talked with one of my colleagues who decided to run a, a marathon. And I said, "Okay, if you do it, I will I will do it as well." One year later, and, okay. and then I I had to I had to start running because you know doing a marathon without properly exercising can be very painful. So I decided to exercise, and then running really became uh, this kind of. Um, Mm, I would say addiction even, uh, and also uh, the best way to get rid of stress and, and get uh, get you going when you are experiencing very very difficult uh, uh, working times. And then when I was in office as prime minister, that was actually the best time to exercise because uh, because you always had uh, people who. Uh, whose job it was to run with you and by that I mean my security guard they were they they were first of all very very good sportsmen uh, they were used to that because uh, pro- former the previous prime minister was Andrew Sainzik and then he he did a lot of uh, cycling and a lot of uh, uh, skiing and, and uh, rollerblading and he was really really fast at all of those and, and now I didn't do any of those uh, except uh, except uh, downhill skiing, but uh, but Andros did this um, cross country. So so all the all the uh, things we did were different, but but basically all the all the security details that that both of we had uh, they had to be very very sporty and, and they had to keep up with the, with our pace. So so that was that was great time. What turns you off? Um, I don't like at all uh, this kind of um, um, if, if 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 people don't have uh, principles or or if they don't care. I mean, you need to care about uh, something in your life, and I I, I accept uh, that, and and I I. Fully understand if, if world views on, on some matters are different, but but if you simply don't care, it, it's it's really difficult to 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 understand that for me. I, I, I'm a probably very uh, very let's say passionate about my my work as as politician and, and not only in, in, in politics, um, and that's why I I don't think that you know being Careless is, uh, or, or not not caring is is uh, is like acceptable, <laughs> or, or I don't like it at all. What is your favorite curse word? I don't know. The first curse word that comes to my mind uh, in English is bloody hell, but I don't know why. I don't use it very, very much, <laughs> and as a, as a good Christian, I, I shouldn't probably. But but yeah. Okay, let, let's let's stick with bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Music. What sound or noise do you hate? Uh, if something is falling and breaking, I'm 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 really like the, you know you, you can ask my wife and kids that I'm really hating it if somebody puts. Uh, something uh, on a corner of a table or on a dangerous place and I'm really like getting 
getting anxious because I, I know that there is like 95.7% chance that this is falling and, and, uh, and breaking. And what profession other than you own would you like to attempt? Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a very good question because if I knew it, I would probably do it by now. But, um, but uh, <laughs> I think I, I, I definitely love uh, international stuff. I, I mean, I, I want to see the uh, world uh, uh, at, at, at being much bigger than, than only Estonia. And, and, uh, and I, love, uh, I love working with international teams uh, that have... Uh, a uh, great uh, variety. That's actually has been one of the great luxuries in my life. I have never had this kind of stubborn view that I need to do this or I need to do that. Uh, and then when I have had, I have had it recently. I had one one case when I was really like I really wanted to become a, a member of European Parliament, and that has been the the only time since two thousand seven that I wasn't elected, but, you know, <laughs> that just means that I probably was too, like, too, op- too obsessed with the idea that I need to be elected there. And, and, and that just reminded me that you should never be so, like, uh, you, you just need to do your, your best and, and, and see where the opportunities are taking you and, and uh, what is the best, you know, what is the best moment for you to do something and that to recognize that this is one of the most important talents, I think. What profession would you not like to do? There are many jobs that would be too difficult for me. And I think I'm like relatively clumsy if it's anything to do with, uh, with uh, manual labor. Uh, I'm, I'm very, I admire people who can do like, lots of uh, like for example factory work I, I i would die in the routine and, and I, I i admire people who can do that and and, uh, and yeah everything if i need to be very precise in in let's say uh, like building something or, or putting something together i would probably fail so so i i'd rather not do that and, and save myself and and, uh, and the company from miserable failure if you could be a co-founder of any startup at any era, which one would you choose? Well, I think if we take the present date, I, I think uh, I want to be involved with uh, uh, autonomous uh, driving and, uh, and artificial intelligence and, and actually take world to to next level in this. Do you have any final words for the audience? I want to just reiterate that uh, now it is extremely important time to to think uh, what are the important trends that we need to saw when they are happening uh, and we need to understand them and then we need to uh, comply with them and and even more importantly what uh, are the trends that we should uh, lead uh, how we can uh, take this uh, terrible experience that we are still having with this uh, uh, virus and, and with the lockdown and, and with, uh, uh, let's say, globalization being uh, on pause and, and, and how we w- would we wisely lead uh, our society or our country or our company uh, or our family uh, to, to be uh, much more successful after this uh, COVID virus. I think this is something, you know, if people think about it and, and if, uh, if uh, we, we think about it enough and if we talk about it enough, uh, there is huge potential. And, and I do hope that Estonia will be once again uh, showing the way and, and being uh, perhaps more risk-taking and, and more innovative than, uh, than many others.